Welcome to Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. We are delighted to host you on campus for the inaugural Future of Global Business Conference organized by the newly renamed Barada Center for Global Business. Here at Georgetown McDonough, we see business as an answer, perhaps the best answer to the world's most challenging problems, both social and economic. Of course, global business does not exist in ether. It lives at the intersection of policy and international relations, technology, law, and so many other fields. And as a Jesuit institution, we see it as our responsibility to transform global challenges into opportunities so that businesses serve themselves and the broader world in a meaningful way. Our history at Georgetown is rooted in global discovery, dating back to the earliest days of the Jesuits foundings, 1540. I have often felt this, that the Jesuits are probably the oldest continuously running multinational enterprise in the world. And so we're one of the few schools in the world that can truly say that it's in our DNA to find new ways to build global knowledge and apply it effectively to serve the common good. And I think of, can I, I can think of no better person who exemplifies this vision for the future of global business than the person who made this center and this conference possible today, Joe Barada. For many years, actually, even before I was dean, I remember Joe encouraging Georgetown to reach our potential by better integrating global business with policy, with international relations, and other fields. And this expertise is located in the business school, in SFS, and elsewhere in the university. Joe supported and encouraged us as we built collaborations with the School of Foreign Service through joint degrees at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. And earlier this year, through the generosity of Joe and his wife, Abby, we celebrated the naming of the new Barada Center for Global Business and the endowment of our Global Business Fellows Program. We are so grateful for your continued leadership, for your commitment to our school, and most importantly, for your support of our students. Joe and Abby's vision and ambition for the Barada Center will leave an indelible mark on our students and alumni, on academic scholarship and practice throughout Georgetown and on the global business community for many years to come. To help us achieve these goals, we're grateful to have the capable and visionary leadership of our new executive director of the Barada Center, Anil Kurana, our director and Barada chair in global business, Ricardo Ernst, as well as many faculty and staff who are leading and exploring the intersection of global business in our research, in our centers, and in our programs. Over the next few hours, we will participate in important discussions about how we can be at the forefront of change of global business. We will hear from renowned experts to discuss key issues facing global value chains, cross-border investing, artificial intelligence, and globalization. And we will contemplate how we can forge new ways to lead in the creation of a more just world. So thank you to our speakers, our panelists, for lending your expertise and insights to today's discussions, and for advancing dialogue and thought leadership on some of the key challenges facing society today. I look forward to the time we will spend together in pursuit of this mission, and it's my hope that by the end of the day, we will all be better informed and inspired to make a difference. So since uh, 
The center is named after Joe. I think I'm going to put him on the spot first and ask him a question. So Joe, uh, could you tell us in the room a little bit about what inspired you to name the center and encourage us to embrace global business at Georgetown? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dean Almeida, and thank everybody for uh, coming today and watching uh, uh, online, if that's what you're doing, hopefully. Um, I think we're at an important crossroads uh, in global business where the very efficacy, uh, morality, need for global multinational institutions is being questioned um, by um, politicians um, and media pundits and others, and I think the work that the center uh, will do, uh, will shed important uh, light uh, on the fact that global business is actually a societal uh, good, uh, drives job creation, drives uh, global growth, uh, drives uh, global understanding uh, of one another. Um, but taking a step back, I think Georgetown is uniquely placed uh, to deliver a differentiated uh, business education, the Jesuit tradition of infusing uh, ethics and morality into the study of business and commerce, um, a truly global academic institution, which ours uh, is. Um, we have a leading school of foreign service and public policy. Um, and of course, our location and position as the leading academic institution in Washington, DC, the ability to convene amazing people, even today for this small event, Gina Raimondo, uh, perhaps the most significant commerce secretary in, in, in memory redefining what that role is is coming, which is an amazing thing. But during my time at Georgetown, I'm a 93 uh, graduate uh, of the McDonough School undergraduate. Um, uh, in the early 90s, the university uh, wasn't really taking full advantage uh, of its unique position uh, and resources to deliver a truly differentiated uh, business, or for that matter, foreign service uh, education. Um, I cobbled together a degree that included a minor in government and as many school foreign service courses as I could take because I was quite interested uh, in this intersection of, yes, the hard um, technical skills of finance and accounting and supply chain and operations, but also uh, how that interfaces with the global world, the interconnectedness, the um, foreign policy uh, implications on business. Um, so starting in 2007, when I grew capable of of actually engaging uh, uh, in the school in a meaningful way. Uh, I began uh, on this topic of uh, how we have more uh, cooperation uh, between the schools and academic programming. Um, we endowed a, professor, a professorship in the SFS to focus on the intersection of global business and, and foreign and public uh, policy. And then over the last decade or so, a few alumni, including myself, I'm by no means the only one engaged in this important work from the alumni perspective. Uh, we worked with Jack, the provost, uh, the deans, um, uh, Paul uh, and his predecessor, Dean Hellman and his predecessor to forge um, this sort of interscholastic uh, academic programming, which led to the Global Business Fellows Program, which at the time was a joint uh, effort between the SFS and the business school, and ultimately the joint degree program, the Global Business Affairs major. Uh, which was recently initiated and, and funded by one of my uh, era uh, alumni, which is fantastic. Um, Georgetown uh, is going to continue to innovate uh, thanks to the, to the interest of the school to actually make itself uh, constantly better and the engagement with some alumni, uh, driving closer cooperation um, uh, among the schools to create unique academic uh, programming uh, for the most talented students in the world. I mean, that is our mission here, is to attract uh, the most talented students who want to study the things that we're good at. Uh, and I think we're really good uh, at educating business leaders uh, uh, and people who want to gauge uh, in public discourse, public service. Um, uh, the Global Business Center, uh, what will it do? I, there'll be more uh, talked about that by Ricardo and Anil, but at its core, researching and discussing the most pressing issues facing global business, value chains, uh, uh, and how they have to uh, uh, evolve over time to supply and distribute products. Uh, talent, how do we create more meritocratic and equitable uh, workforces? That's a topic particularly important in the United States. Um, 
the intersection of regulatory and trade policy and how that affects, affects the thinking uh, of global uh, business people. Uh, and address importantly, as I said at the beginning, how and why global businesses are uh, and can continue to be forces for good in the economy and society, driving global growth, enhancing standards of living globally, helping address and solve the climate crisis. You can't do that by regulatory action alone. You have to have a common cause with large global businesses. Um, and importantly, uh, how we bridge opportunity, inequality, in employment uh, in this country and elsewhere. Um, so that, in short, is why, or not short, long, why uh, uh, I was gratified to engage with Georgetown uh, and, and I'm happy to continue to do so. And with that, I'll hand it to uh, Ricardo. Thank you, Joe. Uh, inspiring as always. Uh, welcome. I want to welcome you all to our inaugural conference on the future of uh, global business. It's an interesting title. We call it a connected yet disengaged world. So we're going to be talking about an interesting topic and uh, hopefully we, you're going to get engaged. The McDonald's School of Business is proud to host such an important event to consolidate even further our leadership in the process of understanding the challenges of leading global business. Globalization affects every country, regardless of its economic, political, or social situation. The globalized world forces us to seek and develop appropriate ways to undergo the process. Actually, it is thanks to globalization, and I have said that many times, that many of you have an iPhone, which is touched by more than 7,400 suppliers around the world. And those of you that had a Starbucks coffee before coming, you didn't need it, but in case you had one, so you know a single cup is touched by over 19 countries. There's an open debate about the future of globalization. Is it over or is it changing? We will hear all about it today. I personally believe that globalization is here to stay the world is more interconnected and interrelated than ever. What is changing is not globalization, but globalism. Globalism is an ideology based on the belief that people, information, and goods should be able to cross national borders. In fact, globalism is the ideological component of globalization. That ideology is shifting, but not globalization which continues to exist while taking different forms. Globalization is not a belief, it's the actual spread of technology, products, information, and jobs around the world. We all agree that understanding global business is key for companies practicing it, but it's even more essential for our students. It provides them with job opportunities, cultural awareness, improved problem-solving skills, entrepreneurial opportunities, and personal growth. Leading a global business demands a holistic approach that includes legal acumen, cultural sensitivity, financial agility, and resilience, technological innovation, cybersecurity diligence, sustainability commitment, and talent management expertise, a lot of stuff. Understanding, understanding global business helps students develop cultural awareness and sensitivity. Students learn about different cultural norms, values, and practices, which can help them work more effectively with people from diverse backgrounds. Studying global business can be a transformative experience for students, as it exposes them to new perspectives and challenges them to think critically about the world around them. This can lead to personal growth and development that extends way beyond the classroom. We are excited with the creation of the center and with this conference in particular as an example of the multiple activities we will do moving forward by being the bridge, the platform that links the numerous challenges faced by companies and establish the dialogue with faculty while involving students. The Barara Center and the McDonald's School of Business should be the destination when inquiring what is happening with global business or, as we like to say, the premier destination for global business education. Welcome you all.
Now we're going to hear from Anil. Thank you, Joe, uh, Paul, and Ricardo for that uh, set of uh, introductory remarks. I'm really honored to be actually part of the Barata Center and Georgetown University. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am really uh, looking forward to today. I welcome you to this exciting discussion on uh, the intersection of business, policy, and global ideologies as well. This will be the first of many conferences. I hope we'll actually indulge and engage today to come up with some answers or at least directions to actually go forward in the future. Building on the comments that uh, Paul, Joe, and Ricardo made, uh, I want to spend a few minutes discussing the vision of the Barata Center that Joe has been kind enough to kickstart with uh, his contribution and al also his inspiration, as well as give you a sense for the inspiration for why we chose the title for today the session for today and the kind of discussion we'll engage in, tomorrow, in later on today as well. Secretary Raimondo is going to be here in the evening uh, to perhaps give us some point of views from a US government perspective as well. So we expect the Barata Center, I think as Ricardo said, to be the venue for discussion and exchange on ideas around global business by connecting students and faculty to the business world, to the government and society as well. I think we often forget the role of society which Joe highlighted in his discussion. Society is, I think, at the crossroads of many of the discussions that we have today. But also link it to applied research, which I think our faculty do across all the schools and education. Uh, but last but not the least in terms of vision for the Barata Center, I think we expect it to be an action-oriented research team. I won't call it a think tank because that's as a connotation that's different, but action orientation of the center is important. On just a related note, uh, you may have seen surveys over the last several years on the notion of trust. And I think you may have seen the Edelman trust barometer say that humans or people on the street in general have the least trust in institutions today, ever in the last you know, 100 years since they've been looking at that. It's in this context that we, I think, meet today to try and understand and in the future hopefully resolve some steps to better engage our disengaged world and maybe a different interpretation and building on the Jesuit tradition of the university, uh, Joe's comment regarding troubled and uh, Ricardo's comment regard, regarding bridge, bridge over troubled waters. Remember Simon Garfunkel, you know, 50 years ago, we we're gonna build a bridge over troubled waters in a different sense, but that's the intent. So topics for today and the speakers for today uh, will hopefully help this dialogue. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the, the session by Secretary Raimondo in the evening, the keynote is going to be by Dr. Moise Naim, a well-known thinker, um, as well as ex-Minister of Trade from Venezuela, who's going to talk about globalization. And several sessions during the day amongst leading investors, including Joe, uh, business executives, and uh, thinking about topics around value chains and investing and so on. But also, and you know, no discussion can be had today without talking about AI. So we'll have a session on AI and what good or bad it can do for the world at large. Uh, I'll further discuss some of the center's uh, plans for the next few months and years as well. But uh, before I do that, I want to actually invite Jenny Bay to come to the stage. Jenny is going to moderate a session for on cross-border investing. Jenny is a professor in our finance team with a focus on global finance, ESG, and banking. Jenny, welcome. Thank you very much, Anya. Okay, great. All in timing. All in timing. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the cross-border investment session. Uh, global investment has increased enormously in the past uh, few decades. Can you believe it? 40 years ago, global investment is less than $1 trillion. 20 years ago, this number has increased to just a little bit more than $50 trillion. But two years ago, in 2020, this number is more than $200 trillion. Seems like globalization is an unavoidable trend. However, we also noticed that in recent few years, there's a lot of a risk factor have significantly affected cross-border investment. Just a few examples, like the deglobalization fear, the geopolitical risk, like the Ukrainian-Russian war, the tension between US and China, all kinds of these things. So we are lucky and honored to have three excellent panelists to address these issues today. 
Uh, I'd like to allow me to introduce them uh, one by one. Can I invite the panelists to come to the stage? Great. So let me start. Uh, I guess uh, I do not need more introduction to Joe Barada, the founder of the Barada Centers. Uh, Joe is the global head of uh, uh, private equity of Blackstone, and Joe is also alumni of Georgetown University, not surprisingly, and also the board of trustees at Georgetown University. Welcome to back. Thank you. The next panelist is Stephanie von Friedrich. Uh, she is the managing director of capital markets in Citigroup. And before she taking this important job, she has 30 years successful career at the Inter International Finance Corporation at the World Bank Group. And most importantly, she is also our Georgetown alumni, earned a bachelor degree from the Foreign School of Foreign Service. Welcome back to Georgetown. Thank you. Our last panelist bring a different flavor to this panel. So those two are more from industry experience, but Kevin Walsh has all the triple experience from academia, government, and also Wall Street. So uh, Kevin is a Shepherd Family Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. He's also a lecturer from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. But before that, he served five years as a member of the Board of the Governors of the Federal Reserve System. At that time, I just joined New York Fed. So I still vividly remember how you represent the Federal Reserve System to negotiate with Wall Street and eventually convert Morgan Stanley into a bank holding company and many, many other things you have done. So it's very personally honor to see you in person. Um, so it's a great panelist. I'd like to throw the first open question for all the panelists. How do you perceive the evolution of the cross-border investment. Any new trends or challenges, especially in the recent few years? Maybe we can start with Kevin. So, so guys, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm, not the, I'm the only person here not originally from Georgetown, though I lived three blocks away from here for my 10 years in government. And I fed myself during long nights at Bowie Monger, which I guess has <laughs> become a bit of a tradition. Here. So that's my, that's my connection to Georgetown. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm a dear old friend of Joe's. Um, and I think as we're sitting here, this is probably the biggest moment of consequence of the global economy, certainly of global trade in our adult lifetimes. Uh, there was a time maybe when Joe and I were starting out in finance, where if you wanted to learn about a country, you would go to their financial capital. If you were visiting China, you'd spend your time in Shanghai. If you were a foreigner and you wanted to invest in the US, you'd come to New York. Well, for better or for worse, um, we're now heading to our sovereign capitals, not our financial capitals. We're not even going to our tech capitals anymore. Why? Because where you happen to have uh, be doing your studies and teaching, this has become, for better and for worse, uh, the center of the new global trade economy. Um, so why don't I, having told you why I think this is an important moment, give you just a moment of where I think we are. In the post-war era, uh, if we wanted to measure the state of the economy, we'd look and we'd say the U.S. should be growing at 3%, the globe should be growing at 4%, the global trade should be growing at 5%. That's when things are well. That's the average of the post-World War II environment. And that worked very well. If I wanted to know what was going to happen in the economy six or 12 months from now, I'd look at trade flows. I'd look at volumes, units, and prices. That would make me a pretty good economist. I'd know what was happening. If I look out the window today, the U.S. economic growth, they say, is growing around two. I doubt it, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's two, not three percent. The world should be growing at four percent. I'd say that's at best growing at two percent as we sit here. What about global trade? Global trade is negative. Units that are crossing borders on ships and planes and trains, units are down and down at an accelerating rate. If we add prices because of the surge of inflation, we get some more confusing data. But if trade is doing the same thing today it's done for most of the last 80 years, we have ourselves a problem. That would mean that the global recession is coming in 2024. 
And what makes it hard for us to forecast that, though, is to understand what's happening to the global economy, what's happening to global trade, and how there's a regime shift happening. The regime shift began at some point over the last several years. Uh, the regime shift might have been catalyzed by the former president, but the current trade policy doesn't appear, at least to, to my lens, to be that different. I think what we're seeing is a new regime. And in some senses, I heard from the deans, the professor, and Joe, what I think is the point of this discussion is to say what regime will replace that old regime that had marked the uh, global trade-based world order that we'd grown accustomed to. And it's institutions like this, thought leaders like this, and importantly, businesses, they're going to have to craft that new moment when I turn it back, turn it back to, uh, to our moderator before we go further. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie and, uh, and Joe, would you like to talk more about this question? What is, uh, what is you see the evolution of cross-border investment? Any new trends or challenges? Uh, yeah, there are a few. <laughs> but first, thank you very much for being here. I think. Well, like Joe, I really do um, have a very deep sense that Georgetown is a unique university with certain schools that, when they're together, create a very powerful experience for our students and really make them ready for the world. But I want to actually put my development hat on because I spent 30 years at IFC kind of investing across the capital stack and investing in, you know, from very early startups all the way to publicly listed companies. Um, and over that time period, we saw global supply chains be developed. We saw companies moving to where goods and labor were the cheapest. And as a result, from 1990 to today, you know, exports as a percentage of global GDP have doubled. And what that meant for development, it meant that we went from having 30% of the world's population live in abject poverty, $1.90 a day, to only 8%. We made a huge difference for the world, and we made the world a better place. Now, Post-COVID, we've actually seen that reverse. We've actually seen net outflows from emerging markets, and we're seeing companies make lots of very different decisions about where do they put their supply chains and why, and the geopolitics that overlay that has made it even more complicated. So for me, it's a very difficult time when I think about how do we continue to pull people out of poverty, because what we're going to see is non-state actors and more conflict and fragility, which means more immigration, you know, more people on boats and dinghies coming out of Africa, and that is going to make the world a substantially more difficult place. And this panel is not even going to touch on AI and robotics. So I think we've got a lot to talk about. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think um, capital flows into certain um, economies historically have always been associated with lots of growth. I, I think back to when I was in Europe um, between November of 2001 and the summer of 2012. In, in November of 2001, you still had uh, individual currencies across Europe. It wasn't until January of 2002, and then it took a year to have everybody to have euros. You, you, you just had uh, the single market uh, taking hold. Um, and there was lots of euphoria associated with that. Imagine the capital flows that went to Southern Europe from Northern Europe. We saw those economies flourish and grow very substantially. The UK also was a big beneficiary of the single a common market with with human capital and 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 capital capital flowing uh, into uh, London, um, which which buoyed the entire uh, UK economy. You then saw this sort of convergence uh, idea of Russia, Eastern Europe, Turkey as all convergence plays uh, into the into this single market, uh, which seems kind of. Um, interesting now that, that, that Russia was a highly investable place for Western organizations. But what did it do? Uh, it, it allowed that economy to grow much more quickly than it otherwise could have. Um, so it, there's certainly sort of trends that happen in where capital, where, where it's okay for capital to go for a while and then it's not. But I think we're no longer in this sort of cyclical trend. We're in some different era, you call it a regime, uh, where all of the sudden, uh, uh, governments are trying to make it difficult for capital to flow where it naturally might. Governments are saying, no, don't invest in this particular place because it, it's not in, in line with our foreign policy objectives or other things, which is important because then businesses must act accordingly. So increasingly, it's not uh, businesses and people in boardrooms and, and prospective returns on capital that's driving capital flows, it's policy. Uh, uh, which is very important, I think, for managers of, of businesses uh, to really understand. The other thing is that I, I think for, in the post-war period, um, 
the US government and large businesses had a symbiotic relationship where um, the large companies could um, forward the US objectives, um, technology leadership, uh, opening up markets for large uh, US companies. Um, and now it's much more, I'm not saying it shouldn't be, it is now much more adversarial uh, where businesses are being um, uh, viewed as, as potentially acting contra to uh, what the policy objectives might be. And you're seeing very significant antitrust reviews of, of certain things, and that affects capital flows. So we're no longer in a world where capital flows to the place where it makes sense for capital to flow because business people see opportunities and higher returns on capital um, to more of a command and control, like capital can only go where the policy setters think it, think it should. And I'm not, I think that will result in higher cost of doing business, structurally higher inflation, um, uh, less global growth uh, a, as a result of all these trends. Well, that's a very good summary. I wonder, just following on, on that, Joe, um, as one of the largest companies, investment companies, Blackstone, how you company or you company advise your customers to respond to these challenges? Well, first of all, you have to follow you know, the, the, the rule of law. Uh, and uh, you know, so, so when, it, when it's more difficult to do business somewhere, uh, you know, obviously we're not gonna do business in, in Russia. Mm. Um, uh, not that we were back then because we were worried about business practices and reliability of counterparties and financial statements. And you know, is there recourse in a court of, of law? Mm. Do contracts matter? All of those things kept us out of Russia, not the fact that the US government didn't want us there. In mm -hmm. fact, there was, there, there was an impetus to invest uh, in Russia in that sort of 2003 to 2012 period of time. Um, so um, I, I would say you, you, our, our companies act in the interest of their stakeholders, their employees, their shareholders, the communities around them. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they they operate under under those set of objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's just much more difficult uh, for those companies to consider investments in certain mm -hmm. in, in certain parts uh, of the world that otherwise they might have been willing to consider. But so you, so many of them just withdraw from some areas and regions. Do they substitute it with some others or are they just overall yeah. shrinking this investment? Yeah. I mean, I think right now the major trend in global value chains is um, uh, reorienting supply chains away from China yeah. uh, and into North America, uh, uh, Mexico, and also in Southeast Asia and India. However, it's nice to say, but imagine over how many decades um, the port infrastructure, the materials handling and processing infrastructure uh, that built up to allow uh, China to manufacture stuff at much lower unit cost at reasonable quality uh, that enabled the explosion in global growth. Um, you don't just snap your fingers and reinstitute all of that infrastructure in Mexico or India or Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. It's going to take decades if it happens at all, right. honestly. Right. Thank you for your insight. So, Stephanie, your role has changed from working for the it global has. back to the city. I was so, going to say, I was actually in that period in Russia where we did make yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, when you, so let's talk about Citibank, right? Yeah. Largest global footprint in the world. We are in 95 countries. We have franchises, real banks in 83 countries around the world. So when we look at our client base, our client base is saying we are going to redirect our supply chains. And can you help us? So they're coming to us for finance first in the short run mm -hmm. to say we want to move to Vietnam, which is an emerging economy and an incredibly complex place to be making investment. Or we want to move to Mexico. Maybe we want to come back to the US. But we are seeing our big clients asking for help. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is also driven by sustainable supply chains. So you're seeing us create new products like, you know, sustainability linked bonds, green bonds, blue bonds, because they need to be able to evidence that the entire supply chain is now sustainable. So that I think that's playing into that as well. But for the longer term, um, I want to throw some numbers out there because <clears throat> city is in if you guys follow city, and you know, an amazing, massive transformation. So we're jettisoning all of our retail operations um, around the globe outside of the United States. Um, we're redirecting, again, to think about how do we do more cross-border. And we're doing that for a very conscious reason. So if you look at the MSCI World Index, yeah. okay, 
the 88 countries that make up the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia represent 3.5% of that $16 trillion. Uh, so most investors focus on the 96.5%. Mm. But if you dig a little deeper of those publicly listed companies, that 3.5% actually represents 6% of the capitalization. It represents 15%. Those countries represent 15% of global GDP and a full one-third of the growth in GDP. It's 53% of the world's population growing to 60% by mid-century, and quite frankly, 100% of the world's population growth. So there is going to be opportunity for us to invest in all of these countries, and it will be critical to create peace and stability. Great, uh, great. So, I, so like, let me summarize uh, two points that both of you mentioned. Uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, government now have so many rules on what the private sector should do, and they guiding the whole sector, U.S. trade, shifting away from the China. But uh, the recent research in the recent uh, central bank's symposium, Jackson Hole Summit, uh, the research from Harvard Business School and Dartmouth showing Although the government tried to do so many policies to try to withdraw the manufacturing back to the US, but it turned out the China linked supply chain is not changing that much. And meanwhile, the consumer's cost is significantly higher. So it seems like the policy is not quite uh, successful. So Kevin, you are the uh, policy advisor. In your opinion, how should our government set up more reasonable and helpful rules to help the private sector? Sure, so, so asking, uh has been central banker about why policies we do today don't immediately affect things tonight. Uh, can't, can't, can't help but be reminded of Milton Friedman's famous long and variable lags. Um, when the government, if the government, like our government, were to speak with one voice and were to make it clear to all the business people in that country that this is the policy, it takes a while for that to find its way into the real economy. So I think part of the data that was cited suggests somehow that with a flip, of the, a flip of a switch, these things can happen. If you've got more background in command and control economics like the G2 rivalry of the US and China does, these things can happen more quickly. If in some sense this new regime, again on a bipartisan basis, is, is, has come to the US, it's a somewhat unnatural act, so it takes time for the muscle memory to adopt to the government says X and so we'll follow X. So I think part of it is just a normal, normal lag. I think the second piece is it had been, uh, I think, an agreement among most of the members of the G20 and business leaders and uh, rooms like this that economic growth is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Trade between two parties has positive sum gains. This isn't zero sum economics. They're doing business with us and we're doing business with them because it's good for both of us. In that story, there are no losers from trade because otherwise they wouldn't be part of that voluntary transaction. I think the, the question that's lingering, as I heard from academics at the outset, is does the US and most of our big trading partners still believe that growth is invariably a good thing? And is growth for the other trading partner a good thing or is that somehow bad? Does that make them more dangerous, scarier, more troublesome? I think those are the kinds of questions that have to be answered today. With respect to uh, China and the China-US relations, I think it's easy to say this is all because of COVID. It's easy to say it's all because of US policy, which there's certainly been a regime shift in the last two administrations about China policy. But I also think that part of it is there are changes that are happening domestically in China. Uh, President Xi and his new regime is a different policy mix than most of us had grown accustomed to in many of our trips to China over the prior decade or two. So the domestic changes aren't just happening in the US or aren't, aren't just happening in Europe, they're happening inside China too. And I don't think we've yet worked out the new way in which these great two uh, countries, the two biggest economies in the world are gonna do business together. And um, over the last few years, we've been sort of stumbling through that. I think it's the work of this administration in the US and the work of the China administration to see if there are really gains for trade. And I'll just end with a final point. I think the easiest thing to, the hardest thing to do is to say, what do you want the, hist what do you want the future to look like? Um, do you want China to be strong and prosperous? Or somehow do you want China to be weak and dependent on, on some, of its, some, of its, some of the US's adversaries? And until you have a vision of what you want the US-China relationship to be, it's very difficult to tell companies like Joe's exactly how you want them to invest.
I got it. So for the audience also, we can also have a Secretary of Commerce tonight for the keynote speak. So as you know, uh, she just came back from China and have a lot of these meetings. Leave the challenging question to her this evening and make sure you stay longer. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, I have a personal research. We actually checking China's global ownership. What you said kind of remind, kind of offer some question to a stylized fact we we, re, we we find we find that china's global ownership has increased significantly in the past decade it's almost to be more than 50 percent of china's gdp but meanwhile u.s's global ownership means u.s company own other firms still the highest in the world but it's a significantly dropping trend from 52 billion dollars sorry 52 trillion dollars in the peak to now 12 trillion dollars so earlier you mentioned many of these government rules many of you customers kind of reduce their investment in China and thing. I would like to see how you perceive the reasons why the US investors reduce the overall global ownership, definitely reducing China, but it seems like overall global ownership also reduced significantly. Well, I think um, institutional capital follows returns mm -hmm. um, and it's often pro-cyclical. In other words, you, know, you allocate more to the strategy that's working uh, at the time. Um, and that creates more capital for the strategy and valuations and, and, and other things. And so the, the trade that's worked the best is the US stock market and being long US dollars. Mm. And so that is attracting uh, and continues to attract more capital. One of the worst places to be uh, was investing in, in China, particularly the large uh, um, you know, uh, China technology companies that were once high flying and then came back down to earth and it's hard to get the money out once it's invested and there's not highly liquid capital markets and all those things. So so part of it is it just hasn't been a good place to be. So people don't want to allocate mm. capital to it in a way. It's probably the place where we should be allocating uh, more capital because I think in the broad sweep of time, I'm not sure China is going to be completely isolated and withdrawn uh, from the global uh, 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 highly interconnected economy. But that's beside the point of your question why are people allocating less capital because it hasn't been a good place to be and the political reg rhetoric the regulatory regime the trade barriers the other things makes it much harder now mm. just practically uh to invest uh as much or in the same sectors in china as 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 investors had been historically got it um, stephanie i know even not many years in city do you by chance uh, know how cities uh, they, they see the city's investment globally. Do they also, their customers reduce their ownership? Well, I actually want to focus specifically on China because uh -huh. I think China is an interesting example. If you talk to our customers and clients in China, hmm. they're actually far more bullish on the economy than the geopolitical overhang that you're hearing in the US. And I think that at least I would argue that most institutional investors are underweight in China. I mean, I just, I look at the size of the population. I look at domestic savings. So if you think about, you know, kind of pre-pandemic, 35% domestic saving rates, post-pandemic, 50%. Yeah. So when the middle class in China starts to spend again, there's going to be opportunity to make money. And maybe it isn't, you know, in these really restricted areas where the U.S. is trying to, you know, push us out of tech. But I, I, I think we're underweight in China. Um, I, I also fully agree that we have made it harder and harder for U.S. companies to invest overseas. Um, regulation, policy, you know, um, transparency and reporting. And, you know, if you flip that on its head in terms of the Chinese investments, again, putting back my development hat, the kinds of investments I saw the Chinese make across Africa and across Asia um, were non-transparent. You know, we're, we're huge loans to governments. And one of the reasons why you're seeing most of the poorest countries in the world over indebted has a lot to do, you know, with China Inc. and what the PRC has done. Got it, got it. Both of you seems like mentioning the reason they reduce the global ownership because, they, because US market is better, so they invest more. And I guess the recent interest rate increase uh, definitely making more money flow into the thing. Then I want to ask uh, Calvin this question. You're not only just a, a policy advisor, you're also sitting on the board of directors of a multiple company like UPS. I guess some of you um, companies may ask your opinion how this uh, inflation or the high interest rate, uh, this kind of regime, how that is affecting the cross-border investment? So not well. Um, so, so, <laughs> so that suffices for that question. Let me see if I can frame that a little more broadly. 
I agree with what Joe said about the pro-cyclicality of investment. But if I were to sit back and sort of try to evaluate the economy today, I think we should be more uncertain about real economic growth in the next 12 months versus almost any period in our adult lifetimes. We should be more uncertain about the level of prices in the next 12 months versus almost any period in recent history. My own guess is we've entered a period of uh, a new era of price instability, not price stability, which is a new question then for every household and business. It's not that inflation is going to be at such high levels for the next 10 years, but my guess is there'll be huge variance around that. And that makes it harder for businesses and households to make decisions. I sort of prefer the definition of uh, inflation that former Chairman Greenspan would use versus what's now uh, much talked about in the profession. Now we say inflation is 2.0%. I find the decimal points really are just for, for jokes. We should be focused on the <laughs> left side of the decimal point. <laughs> Chairman Greenspan said, I want the level of inflation to be such that no one's talking about it. I don't want any household or business to be worried about it so they can think on the hard decisions they've got. The last few years, households and businesses have had to think a lot about inflation. I think that will continue to be the case for the next few years. So if you have elevated uncertainty about uh, the real economy, elevated uncertainty about the nominal economy, elevated uncertainty over where the government's going to say you can and can't invest, and then you look at the financial markets, measures of risk in these markets are very low measures of volatility in the stock market, even the bond market, quite low by historical standard. That'd be enough to be very concerning to, uh, to a former government economist as well as to an investor. I think where we are now, to answer your question, is what you're seeing almost everywhere in the world is a return to home country bias. Mm -hmm. We're uncertain about what's happening out there, so we bring it closer to home. We bring our trade closer to Canada and Mexico and even manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, we bring our capital allocation closer to a place, not only where there have been good returns and higher interest rates, but where we think if we get it wrong, we can change more quickly. We bring our investments to things that are more liquid, not less liquid. So if there's a world where there's another shock, a shock like a pandemic, a shock like a global recession, a shock like a war like we're seeing in Russia and Ukraine, we can pivot without having too much of a consequence. So in some sense, if most of us grew up at a time of integrated, tr uh, integrated global capital flows and trade flows and data flows and labor flows, even those in, the, in light of those new uncertainties, we're bringing it closer to home. And I think the hard question, is that the new normal? Is that the new structure of the global economy or is that just a transitional phase? And I think in some sense, that's up to the U.S. government and the Chinese government to see whether that's whether that's a permanent fi fixture or not. Thank you very much for the insight, uh, Joe. Back to the question, back to you. How do you see uh, how do you see uh, the it's a high interest rate risk and the uncertainty affecting Blackstone's customers this investment? Well, all of a sudden, when you have a risk-free rate that's positive, you know that becomes an attractive place to allocate capital. Most investors were saying, no, they were issuing 30-year bonds, 10-year treasuries, bank deposits, highly money market funds, because you could earn a grand total of maybe 1.5% doing that. So you'd allocate to uh, asset classes that could give you more yield. Now they're saying, well, wait a minute, I, I can earn five uh, risk-free, like that's a pretty good thing. I'm going to allocate less to riskier assets. So it does make it harder uh, for uh, uh, managers of riskier equity assets, particularly those that don't have a lot of liquidity or other things, uh, to raise money. That being said, fortunately, most investors do have a long horizon and over long periods of time, uh, allocating to high quality you know, equities, whether they're public or, or private, does make sense. But in the short term, there's this reallocation of capital. The, the, the policies of the central bankers in, in, in our country were driving uh, endowment and, and pension plan man, uh, managers to allocate more to riskier assets. That is the consequence of taking the risk-free rate and putting it to zero for much longer than anybody expected. And then very important economists saying it's lower for longer and all then you should get used to this and blah, 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 deflation and you know whatever. Um, so, but from my perspective as an investor, when we're looking at buying a, a security, buying a stock or buying, in my case, buying a company, um, uh, I'm used to the world where we have a 5% 10-year treasury. You know, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years. Uh, and for only 
the last eight or nine of those 30 years did we have negative real rates of interest and in, you know 30 times PE in the S&P 500. Um, and so we're back to a world that's much more familiar uh, to me. And we are able to deploy capital now uh, into companies that reflects mm. this higher cost of capital. And that means we will generate better returns, you know, better unlevered returns. Maybe the levered returns are a little bit lower, but um, fundamentally buying um, uh, things unlevered is what, is what we're meant to do. And those returns are now higher uh, than you know, setting up a deal three or four years ago. So I think this will be a great time uh, to allocate capital uh, to a long dated, you know, uh, 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 equity portfolio. Well, that's great. I, that's what I make me feel like a 30 year experience, definitely valuable. I only see a very short time period to see there's a high inflation, yes. but for you- As most of our employees, you know, at, at Blackstone have only seen, you know, yeah. the zero, Correct, is there a lower bond? Multiple expansion and, and you see longer. Bean stocks grow to the sky, right? That is yeah. helpful. Yes. The so same thing for Stephanie. You have also 30 years experience in World, Group, World Bank, and th there you're managing like across more than 100 countries and all their investment committee. Do you think, uh, based on your experience, that maybe you can bring it to the city? Is that possible? We can hedge against those uh, geopolitical risks, like the Russian Ukrainian yeah. war, for example? Yeah, that, that's a fault line. For sure. Um, well, so first of all, I mean, I think a lot's been said about, um, you know, where where yields are, where U.S. Treasuries are, and why the money would flow back, right? I mean, why would you take cross-border risk? Why would you add FX risk if you can get five percent in an, you know, a risk-free yeah. asset? That makes a lot of sense. I also think you're also seeing a lot of longer-term investment in the infrastructure space being redirected to the United States, especially as it relates to the IRA. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, we have seen projects crater in Egypt, in in Namibia. I mean, I can go around the globe, right? But green hydrogen, renewables, and all of that's being reshifted because of the IRA and because of the tax incentives that the US has put into place. But you know, in the 30 years that I've been playing, I have never seen the geopolitics as it plays out today. The economies, and everybody said this, they're more interconnected than they've ever been, but the geopolitics is falling apart. And I really go back to this notion that we in America believe, or believed, that free markets and capitalism and democracy all went together. And when they were hand coupled together, in essence, the rest of the world accepted our rules and the way that we operate. That is not what's happening today. There are multiple different kinds of countries with different kinds of economic models. The, the global south is decoupling. When we see countries like Saudi Arabia and India rising to the surface, and then you, know, you mentioned the war in Ukraine, but it has weaponized energy and food and completely changed the way that we need to be thinking about things geopolitically. So I, I think it's never been harder um, to figure out how you actually invest internationally and especially in emerging markets. And I think you're gonna see that continue to play out. Got it, so very challenging. Very challenging. You, you two gentlemen agree with that or you have different opinions? So I'll add a couple things. This is a very parochial American view. So please, please <laughs> sit, sit comfortably <laughs> for a moment. Um, <laughs> The United States has led on questions of economics and interest rates and stable prices and trade flows um, for most of the post-war era. Some might think that we didn't lead in the right way and we didn't get everything right, absolutely true. But absent US leadership on these questions, um, I worry that global growth will fall. Trade flows will fall dramatically. There will be a huge vacuum left by the absence of US leadership on these questions. This is not a, a, um, a recommendation to go back to the status quo ante. The status quo ante does no, no longer exists. That is no longer a safe place. If only we brought back the trade policies of a prior administration or a prior time or prior regime, everything would be swell. The world has moved. So I think it's incumbent upon the administration to develop not just a set of tactical judgments about the next summit between President Xi and President Biden, not just a set of uh, uh, a common statement of the next G20, but what does the US believe and what is the future of the global economy that it sees and what is our role and what is the role of these other major important actors? Until we've identified that, until we provide the vision, the global growth is likely to uh, chronically underperform, which I think adds to geopolitical risks. When the two most important economies in the world are moving quickly up and to the right, when China's growth is six or 7%, the US is growing at three, 
there have always been tensions. I've been part of those meetings for a decade in government, but no one really wanted to upset the apple cart too much. When the global economy rolls over, when global trade rolls over, when the Chinese domestic economy weakens, when the US economy is weakening, as I believe it is, that's when the geopolitics get worse. So I think the US has a special role here to play um, based on history, based on the size of our economy, based on the dollars, the world's reserve currency. And if we don't step into that role, I think you're gonna end up with a worse situation. Maybe just one final point. Um, we were in an equilibrium, not a perfect equilibrium for how trade and the global economy worked for a couple of generations. But equilibrium has been beaten out of us, catalyzed by COVID, I think catalyzed by a global recession, which I already see seeds of in most of our major trading partners. But it would be rare to go from one equilibrium to another equilibrium. Usually there's a disequilibrium first. There's a market forcing event. There's uh, a certain amount of, uh, I would say disharmony in financial markets. And so again, that's why I think there's risk in the next 12 months that both academics uh, listening to this as well, students and investors in the audience need to pay heed to. Can I just, can I just add ahead. one thing to that? Because I think you're absolutely right. And if you look at the G20 communique that came out, the fact that those countries could not come together and condemn an illegal invasion of a sovereign nation in European soil Right, says a lot about where the G20 is, or the G21 now, I guess. Joe, anything add up? Nothing to add. To Nothing to add? <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. I think, uh, I think we want to open, the, open to the floor for the open up a question. There are microphones on both sides. Anyone have a question, please uh, come to the front and wait in the line to the questions. Hey, thanks for being here today. Uh, Shane Culver, I'm a national security professional, but uh, business student here, so still kind of learning this whole business thing. Um, yeah, at Mr. Barada, you had mentioned this kind of friction between business and policy leaders. Um, as we're seeing policy utilize business as kind of a foreign policy lever. And then ma'am, you also mentioned uh, the weaponization of things like energy and food security. So facing these realities, uh, I guess I'm wondering, how do we close that gap between business and government leaders um, and ensure that that relationship continues to synergize versus being at odds with one another? And uh, where, if any, should business and policy kind of compromise or come meet in the middle? No, it's, uh, these are good questions. And, and, and I think as I was careful to say, it's not, um, it's not necessarily out of line that there's more regulation now and more scrutiny uh, of particularly the very large uh, uh, corporations uh, that have grown up over the last you know, couple of decades in this country. We have multiple trillion dollar plus market cap companies. Um, so uh, I, I wasn't trying to make a, a statement one way or the other. It's just a fact. There is more uh, government engagement now uh, in business, particularly multinational business, not multinational businesses. Uh, and I think the answer, it's also, um, you know, the pendulum swings. I mean, we, we, we came from a world of, of uh, capitalism unleashed and lots of global growth and very significant, you know, global integration. Um, and the economies were growing. And we're now in a period uh, of, of, of backing away from that, and there's much more, you know, there 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 are policies, you know, antitrust policies and other things that that are positioning big businesses sort of bad and taking advantage, um, and so we're just we're in this disequilibrium kind of phase, and I think it will come back round because at the core, I think most global forget the really huge business, most companies are actually trying to act in the best interests of all of their stakeholders, their employees, their shareholders. Uh, they're trying to make these businesses better. And I think there needs to be um, uh, more discussion at government policy making levels, people in the executive branch, in the Congress. The only time I think business comes down is when, you know, the Senate panel wants to, you know, investigate one thing or another, rather than really trying to understand, like, what is on your mind? What, what's working? What isn't working? And I, I think there just needs to be a shift in in attitude, more cooperative, um, uh, less adversarial on, on both sides of the, the private sector and the government sector. 
So Jenny, can I jump in? Because I, you know, if I were the CEO of a multinational company, I would understand how complicated it's become. We have sanctions, we have new regulation, we have controls, we have local data, you know, localization. Yeah. There's all these issues that they're grappling with far easier to come back to home. So I think we need three things. First, we're gonna have to um, uplift our boards of directors. We need directors who really understand geopolitics and what's happening in the world. I think if you look across the, you know, the, the S&P 500, you're gonna find a lot of board members who don't have that expertise. Second, you've got to re-examine your operations and control frameworks to say, are we actually looking at things the right way? So I think you're gonna see financial institutions and big corporates doing a lot on that risk and that review risk. And then exactly to what Joe said, if you actually look at the differential between the way businesses in Europe function with their governments and the way the United States has historically done that, we need better dialogue between policymakers in this country and business people because they need to hear both sides. And so I think that deeper dialogue is critical. Thank you very much. Question? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ashley Lenahan. I'm a professor of practice in the School of Foreign Service. Uh, and my question for you is actually specifically about outbound investment screening. And I wanted to hear from you from the investor perspective, because we talked a little bit about the strategic and kind of normative concerns, but from the investor perspective, what the biggest challenge you think is going to come from, from the US regime and the potential adoption of regimes in the UK and Germany and potentially Europe uh, on a wider level? You know, is it, is it the cost of adaptation and monitoring and compliance, or is it concerns over this uh, being applied to a far greater number of sectors and countries? What, what is the biggest kind of concern you have as investors? Boy, I would, I would actually spin that answer a little differently. If I were an outbound investor, you know, and when I was at IFC, I would say my biggest concerns are FX risk and how do you hedge against that? Where does the dollar go and does the dollar remain, you know, the, the currency reserve of the world? And more importantly, where does regulation go in the countries in which I'm investing? And what does that imply for my ability to run my business in the fashion in which I've made that assumption? Because we, we, we've all said this, but for many years, regulation was relatively stable in many of these markets. It is shifting and it's shifting rapidly. So what implications does that have for that outbound investment? And is it easier for me to think about technology, robotics, and AI and put my investment in the US or very near to the US? I think that's well, well said. I, the, the reason to invest anywhere is because you think you can invest a dollar and earn an attractive return uh, on that dollar. And so the first, the first screen is like, is there a commercial opportunity in this market? Um, and that's influenced by any number of factors. Regulation and reporting requirements, all that just makes it a little difficult. It, it, it puts a little friction. It doesn't fundamentally change the, the investment decision-making framework. It's like, is this an attractive market? Can I sell my product or service? Um, and then you start thinking about risk management. Well, what, like, is, that, is the currency reliable? Uh, is my counterparty credible? Uh, is there a contract that's enforceable because I'm relying on, you know, on a counterparty to, to facilitate my entrance there or be a supplier or a distributor or whatever? Uh, and, and if you're a good risk manager, that begins to weed out the markets that you shouldn't be in in the first place. I use the example of, of, of Russia. Uh, and then, but however, there are certain economies, you know, China being one where um, it could be a very attractive commercial opportunity, but it's very hard because of um, very, you know, mega policy trends at play that go beyond. And then it's just like, is it even worth it anymore? Like, I, it's not predictable, even if you think there's a narrow commercial opportunity. So that's kind of the mental model that we go through when we're looking at different markets, both for our companies to enter and then for us making a new investment in, 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 in a market we might not be in. Any other question? Go ahead. Yeah. We're gonna collect in one, or one more question. Yeah. Harsh Butra, uh, Harsh Butra, second year MBA at Georgetown. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think the insights are really helpful for us to connect the dots with the theory and uh, the real world practices. Uh, I worked in manufacturing in India before that, so I am very concerned about the, where the US dollar is going to flow in the near future. Uh, my question is around uh, policy driven investing. 
So currently, the geopolitical scenario around Ukraine war or U.S.-China relations is essentially driving the policy at the federal level. Uh, my concern is, uh, uh, so the question is, uh, will we see in the near future policymakers or people in the policy vertical coming up with the private equity investors to invest on basis of policy itself? Uh, uh, because these policy tend to have a uh, five to 10 years of effect. And then uh, uh, that is also the segment uh, uh, private equity investors look to invest into. So will we see more of this investing coming up, uh, coming up in the future? Well, I think w one example of it would, would be the Inflation Reduction Act, which created very significant subsidies for uh, solar investment and other infrastructure projects, which has attracted very significant both private and public capital. So that is one good example. We tend not to like to invest behind a, a policy initiative solely as the basis of doing, because policies change. Um, and it's, and you, you, it's very hard to get in and get out of something. You have to assume you're gonna live with it for a long time. And if the policy changes and that destroys the economics, then it's probably not something we want to do in the first place. But certainly, policy tailwinds is something that we absolutely consider uh, as we're looking at, at investing, yes. Kevin. So let, let me just build on a couple things Joe said first. Um, uh, uh, policy tailwinds uh, work well for an investment until the policymakers change their mind. <laughs> so Joe is right to try to focus on the underlying fundamentals. In your question, you talked about the job both of people studying this as well as those of us on the panels to connect the dots. But policymakers tend to make those dots in pencil. And so then they erase them. Because if they make them in pen and they're wrong, they have a problem. So, so I think in some sense, the most important thing policymakers could do is they could listen to a whole group of businesses, large and small, other constituencies, and then do this thing that they don't always like to do, decide. This is our policy. This is how we're going to run things. And for most investors, so long as the policy is known, even if it's suboptimal, they can figure out how to be successful, how to allocate capital, where the next dollar should go, what the risk adjusted return benchmark should be. But if policymakers are afraid to put their money where their mouth is, to be clear on what the policies are, and they change them, not just prospectively, but retroactively, you invested in that semiconductor facility last year. Well, it's now prohibited by law. That's the right way, it strikes me, to do harm to your economy, but even more so to convince the rest of the major countries in the world that you're not providing the kind of leadership that you need. Can I just touch on yes, Ukraine? Yes, absolutely. Because I do think it's really important. And this actually goes all the way back to my SFS days because I uh, was a Soviet area studies major. Um, but I've been deeply ingrained in Ukraine for many years, and I'm watching U.S. policy and I'm watching European policy. So the U.S. has committed $83 billion of tax money to win the war in Ukraine. The Europeans are sitting on the side. Uh, collectively, they've committed roughly 90 and they've dispersed nothing. And they're giving a lot of subsidies to their own companies to start investing in Ukraine, full cover 100% through their ECAs. You know, their export credit agencies and their development finance institutions. We're not doing any of that. And we're going to spend a considerable amount of taxpayer money winning the war, and the Europeans are going to rebuild Ukraine. And I actually think we collectively, from a policy perspective, need to re examine how we get American companies That's a good to point. Ukraine. But I think your manufacturing in India is a smart thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. The conversation on global investment can continue on and on, on, but we have to make sure the agenda of conference go as it. Let's give uh, our panelists, Joe, Stephanie, and Kevin, a great applause.